four words to start the programme tonight. Klinsman. Shearer. Matthews. Class. Good evening. Tonight we profile Jurgen Klinsmann, who's made such an impact in English football, and Sir Stanley Matthews, 80 years young today, who was English football. We'll see Alan Shearer in action as we bring you the night's big match. Blackburn Rovers against Leeds United. Shearer, of course, has been in devastating form. British boxer Billy Schwer was hoping to prove his world class as he took on Rafael Ruelas of America for his world lightweight title. We have that fight. There's European ice skating from Germany with the Pairs Championship. And we look ahead to the weekend's Rugby Internationals in the Five Nations Championship and the fifth test in Australia. Alan Hansen's with us. And we begin our sports night at Ewood Park with Blackburn Rovers against Leeds United. A Blackburn win would put them seven points clear of Manchester United at the top. Our commentator for the match, Clive Tilsley, and look out for a dramatic start. Chris Sutton has a new partner. It wasn't quite the perfect marriage thanks to this rearranged football fixture but Chris's long-standing wedding date with Samantha went ahead yesterday as planned. The honeymoon for Sutton has already begun here in Blackburn. 45 goals in partnership with Alan Shearer are testimony to that, although they're without their regular supply line for the right flank tonight. Stuart Ripley injured, Robbie Slater ill, Mark Atkins is recalled. All the players were at the wedding reception last night. I understand the orange juice was flowing. Leeds United, fresh from three straight wins, are without the suspended David Weatherall. It means Carlton Palmer reverts to the centre of the defence, which welcomes back Tony DiRigo after injury. Both of their South African imports, Radaba and Masinga, are included, but their record Ghanaian import, Tony Yaboa, is still on the bench. The man in charge tonight is Roger Gifford. Last Wednesday night, Manchester United actually had the chance to overhaul Blackburn at the top. This Wednesday night, Blackburn can put seven points of daylight between themselves and the defending champions. And with a similar gap between United and the rest. It's a sign of the way the leaders are now stretching out the championship field that Leeds in seventh place are actually closer on points to the bottom club than they are to Blackburn Rovers. Free kick to Blackburn. Pitch is a little bit sticky, but considering the amount of rain that they've had in this part of Lancashire, is in particularly good condition. Mark Atkins playing on the right-hand side of midfield. Sherwood chasing Shearer. And Shearer has got away from Pemberton. And shot straight at Lukic. A chance in 60 seconds for Alan Shearer, who has been absolutely prolific against Leeds United. Here's Brian Dean at the other end. He's away from Flowers, where he would have been. Now, a referee's burn his whistle. What a dramatic start here. Flowers way outside of his penalty area. And what will Roger Gifford deem the necessary action? Ewood Park holds its breath. minute 35 seconds and that's the sum total of the night for Tim Flowers what a start his opposite number Lukic made a save from Shearer inside of a minute and inside of a minute and a half Flowers commits a foul which signals the end of his night who didn't play at all during the course of 1994. It's his first senior game since a League Cup tie at White Hart Lane in December 93. Flowers goes off for the foul on Dean. Well, are you sitting comfortably? Then we'll begin. McAllister. There have been traffic problems all around Ewood Park this evening which necessitated a delay in the kickoff and those who are caught in the traffic have missed 
A most compelling opening. Brian Dean just caught by Tim Flowers. In fairness to the centre forward, he did his utmost to avoid the keeper and go on and score himself. What Tim Flowers couldn't avoid was the dismissal. Shearer, who scored seven times in his three Blackburn games against Leeds United, missing a really good chance after just 60 seconds. And Dean, with an even better chance, denied at the other end by the foul, which led to Flowers' expulsion. Shearer trying to feed Sutton, down he goes, referee points the spot! Roger Gifford is having a busy night. Chris Sutton getting involved in a flare-up. One or two others on the edge of the penalty area. The whole match is overheated. Carlton Palmer was in the thick of it. Chris Sutton, who forced his way on. It was Gary McAllister who got in the challenge. Gary Kelly was there too. Down went Sutton. Finger pointed immediately towards the spot. We've had just five minutes, and Alan Shearer has another opportunity to build on that impressive goal-scoring record against Leeds. Shearer from the spot in a breathless start. A Blackburn lead 1 0. It's going to be a long, long night for them with 10 men, but they've got a lead to defend. Alan Shearer successful from the spot for the ninth with time this season. And season, successful overall for the 27th Alan time Shearer. this season. in the opening six minutes to Philip Page. Here's Masinga. Speed. Lasso made a good challenge. Sutton back there helping out. Now David White for Leeds. On by Dean. Smart stop by Mims. from Gary McAllister to his uh, teammates there is to keep passing. I think the message from Kenny Dalglish will be keep chasing. Sutton who's dropped a little bit deeper behind Shearer. who will leave the line alone. He may just need it to good effect again here. He's held it up for Wilcox. It's blocked by Palmer. McAllister. Speed. This is Massinga. Not away from Pierce, but uh, Berg was there. And Sutton has won a goal kick. This is New Wife in the uh, middle. I don't know. Our first night of marriage, and he's out with the lads. going for gold himself, trying to use the uh, element of surprise, and the ball actually bounced off the goalpost after Mims had patted it down. I think the uh, Blackburn standing goalkeeper had the situation principally under control. That's the end of the half. It was a half 
that went out of the blocks like uh, gold medalist sprinters. I think the journalist type riders were steaming up in the press box after two minutes. Tim Flowers had already left by then, red carded. On came Bobby Mims in his place. But after six minutes, ten men Blackburn took the lead with yet another goal from Alan Shearer against Leeds United. Hold on to your seats at the start of the second half. Is anything like the start of the first? Mind you, after that instant dismissal and the debatable penalty award in the first five minutes or so, the game became pretty raw and racy, but wasn't particularly eventful or entertaining after that extraordinary start. Rather ironic anniversary today, three years ago to the day that Howard Wilkinson brought Eric Cantona into English football. 1st of February, 1992. He signed on a three-month loan from Nîmes, and before the three months were up, Leeds were champions. The story didn't end there. Sherwood. Wilcox is in the middle. It's come back for Warhurst. And now Wilcox. Deflected behind for the corner. Gary Kelly got in the challenge. And even a man like Blackburn Rovers are such a good counter-attacking side. They have plenty of pace and plenty of thrust. <laughs> Towards Shearer. Just got under a little bit. Jason Wilcox is swinging corner. Alan Shearer couldn't quite get up high enough. Sherwood. Sutton. Come off McAllister for Shearer. He can score from anywhere. It's not just the number of goals that he scores, it's the variety and quality of them that make him so extraordinary and such a complete centre forward. Sutton, plenty to his left, Lasso and Wilcox. It's Graham Lasso here. One handed stop by Lukic. Graham Lasso bursting forward from fullback, fed by Chris Sutton. White's header, Brian D. Forced white by Pierce. And eventually forced to the ground. Signed from uh, Chelsea last season for £300,000. It's a loose change by the standards of one or two Blackburn signings, but Kenny Dalglish has got value for money on more than one occasion. Pemberton, Lee trying to ferry the ball around. Paul Blackman one way, then the other. Create a space for somebody like McAllister. Of course, the save from Mims. And both goalkeepers have seen more of the action than they did in the first half. Wilcox to Shearer. Oh, and he almost wriggled free. Just couldn't shake off the last shackle. Dorigo. Kelly. Yes, he was bumped there by Lasso. Gary McAllister has Carlton Palmer venturing forward here. Oh, it's run all the way through to the back post and Radabat 
blocked by Sherwood. Palmer in goes Masinga. Mims did just enough. Dean. Why couldn't get the touch? And Brian Dean shot finished the wrong side of the post. David White, the uh, Leeds United number 14, was there, and if he, well, he got out of the way, he must have felt it was going in. A singer, Dean, Radima, Callister White. He's caught the heel of Nassau, who then got in the way, as he felt entitled to, but the linesman didn't. Dorigo has come across to try and swing one in towards the big men there with his left foot. It's towards Masinga, hooked away by Hendry as far as McAllister. Oh, kicked out somehow by Mims, was it? Referee was right on the line and said no goal. Wonderful save by Mims from McAllister. It was desperately close to creeping over but Roger Gifford could not have been better placed. And Gary McAllister could not have been more unlucky. What a stop by the standing goalkeeper. McAllister with a lot of bodies between himself and the goal, denied by a terrific save. Wow. Close call or what? Dorigo. Away by Pierce. Speed. Speed trying to set himself again. Instead, it's Radaba. All Leeds United's best efforts frustrated so far. It really was a wonderful save by Mims. And look where the referee is there, just in the corner of the picture. And as Colin Henry hooked it away. Roger Gifford couldn't have been better placed, and he said no. Leeds United will make a substitution, a double substitution. Both Masinga and Radaby are being replaced, which means number 15, Nigel Worthington, will come on, and more significantly, number 21, Tony Yaboa. Just taking uh, his ring off. There's Worthington, and here is Yaboa. Well... His uh, entry into the game is going to be delayed until he can get that ring off. And for the moment, Leeds are playing 10 against 10. Lasso, tackled by White. This is amazing. They're going to try and tape it up now so that it's not a, a danger to anybody. Your bar is now on. Almost three and a half million pounds worth from Eintracht Frankfurt. Palmer, White, Sherwood just getting a foot on the ball. White again, now Worthington. Leeds having to work for every yard of space. Dorigo's crossing, goes Yabar! Well, he was first to the ball. Ahead of his marker, he was in front of the near post and the and had to twist those neck muscles to have propelled it goalwards. But the potential is there. Goals galore in Germany. Jaboa. On by Dean. McAllister trying to get in there. Wilcox ran right across. They all look to the linesman and he says penalty. He's put his flag across his chest now. Will Roger Gifford confirm what his linesman feels he's seen? There's no doubt in my mind that the linesman will advise the referee point to the spot. Put his flag across his chest. Alan Shearer wants to be called as a witness. So does Jason Wilcox, but they've only talked their way into trouble. Mike Newell, the uh, Blackman substitutes there too. The linesman is Joe Copeland. What's the decision? Not 
he's running to the spot, he's making his way, and the penalty is what it is. Blackburn will try to delay the taking of it for as long as they reasonably can. Leeds United have been awarded one penalty so far this season, and it was saved. Gary McAllister took it. This time against Bobby Mims. It's equalised. Blackburn six minutes away from winning it. Are pegged back by Gary McAllister. Hard and true down the middle. And it's 1-1. McAllister's first goal for more than three months. And McAllister it was who won it, and Jason Wilcox it was who just ran across him. We had the most explosive start, and we're in for a big finish. McAllister towards speed, cut out by Berg, only for Drigo, now you're bowled. to run away from Henning Berg, running out of pitch. Plenty to consider, plenty to talk about. Plenty to argue about, I dare say. And it's all square as we tick into stoppage time. Shearer. Warhurst. Now Sutton, cross came Palmer, clean challenge. There's an offside flag raised anyway. And it's a free kick to Leeds United. Well, he's done pretty well the night after his wedding, hasn't he? And particularly in an unfamiliar role for much of the night, having to break from midfield following the reduction of Blackburn's resources to just ten men so early in the game by Roger Gifford. It's been a night when the referee has needed eyes in the back of his head, really. He's set to be called upon to make some momentous decisions. It's a draw. The first of the season, ironically, here at Ewood Park. The first home points Blackburn have dropped since Manchester United won here in October. Two penalties don't begin to tell the story of all the drama and all the debate. Gary McAllister equalising Alan Shearer's effort so late in the day. Leeds stretch their unbeaten run to seven games and prevent Blackburn stretching their title lead beyond five points. They're in pole position, all right, but still a long, long way from the chequered flag. Oh, and now there's, an, there's a, an incident developing on the field. There's a fan got onto the pitch, and it's the players who are acting as peacemakers here. One that's solitary supporter. And we will no doubt grab his share of headlines, but shouldn't be allowed to take away from the efforts of the players who have given us such a rip-roaring cut tie of a sort of match. 1-1, it's finished. Where do you start with that one? <laughs> I don't know. It'd be nice to start where it finished. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, you can't. Uh, it's typical, isn't it? We saw it in the World Cup. You know, the keeper goes off, he's got to go off. Um, they're down to ten men. And to be quite honest, we'd like to come away with a point, but we wasted the first half. I think I think we we were more thrown by it than them. We got more upset than them. We lost our composure more than they did, um, and finished up not playing too well. Were there any complaints in your dressing room about the key decisions tonight? Well, there's always complaints, aren't they? Um, but as I said to the to the media the upstairs, uh, the press lads, I said there's no way I'm, I'm going to hear about about uh, refereeing decision or officials. They don't deserve the credit in the headlines tomorrow morning, our players deserve that. 
there was ten men, they were magnificent, and um, I think they were really unlucky not to come away with, with the three points. Second half, we did much better. We were much more patient. We passed and moved. We kept the ball. We looked for openings. And after the first ten minutes of the second half, when, when they were fresh, you know, gradually and gradually and gradually, it always looked as though we were going to score. That was fast and furious, that match. I guess odds were about even in the end. Yeah, Might I think score. Leeds deserved a draw. They played well in the second half. Blackburn were magnificent with ten men. Yeah. But it certainly was a game for the faint-hearted, just the sort of game that I used to love playing in. <laughs> but, <laughs> Let's look at one or two of the incidents. And first, yeah, the Flowers sending Well, off. the referee's got no option but to send Tim Flowers off. The ball's played through to Brian Dean. He goes round Flowers, who comes out, tackles with his feet, brings him down, and... You know, Dean's gone home and go, he's just going to put it in, he's got to send him off, he's got no option. You can see here, he goes round him, and he's made contact, nowhere near the ball, and he's got to send him off, he's quite right. But We're Blackburn played magnificently with ten men, they really did, they battled and they defended and they worked hard for each other. Mm. Leeds came back into the second half, and I thought they just about deserved a draw. Let's look at the penalties and see what you made of those. Well, the first one's on Chris Sutton. He's run through, he's left McAllister, who's tracked back. There's a little bit of a tug there, maybe an elbow. I think it's open to the beat. I've seen them given, but maybe, maybe not. Mm -hmm. You know, the referee was on the spot, he gave the penalty kick. For me, this second one's definitely harsh. McAllister goes for it. Wilcox just lets it run past them. I think they just bumped into each other. Five minutes to go, they've played magnificently for 85 minutes. Maybe a bit harsh. Yes. That penalty kick, but I definitely thought Leeds deserved, you know, to get one point at the game. And we thought when we saw it first time round that Leeds had scored. McAllister's uh, effort had gone in, but it ran around the line somewhere, didn't well, it? Well, that's right. He's coming here. He's 25 yards at hit it right peg. It's a great save from Bobby Mims. And from that angle, I think that's definitely Looked a goal. In, yeah. You know, Colin Henry gets off the line, but look where the referee is. Roger Gifford. He's in a great position. And this is a special camera that we've got in the goals. And we can see here that it comes right along the line and Henry gets it out. Full a great to the save and, and good covering from, yeah. from Colin Henry and full match to the referee as well. Good yeah. position. We know that rule, don't we? Because Mr Hill is forever well, telling us that something about the whole that. of the ball, ball has got to be over the whole of the line. Yeah. 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 But um, do you think there's, a, there's an awful lot of petulance creeping into these games now? I know the games matter, they matter so much with the championship at stake, but almost every game you see now, the referees are being chased around the pitch when, they, mm. when the players don't like a decision. It's getting worse. I think it's always been the same, even you know, when I played. I wouldn't go run after referees, but I'd have six or seven that would go run after them. I think the referees have got to clamp down. As you say, they're playing for the big prizes, but you can't have it where players are running after referees and manhandling them and, and giving them you know, volleys of abuse, they've got to clamp down it. As soon as they run after them, say 10, 15 yards, and say something out of turn, then they've got to book them, and that would stop it. You don't think it's getting worse? No, I think it's always been the same. Has it? Always been the same. All right, then. Now about that fan who ran onto the pitch um, afterwards. Um, uh, he was arrested by the police. He's been charged with encroaching on the pitch. He made for the referee, Roger Gifford, as you saw, who's not pressing charges. He's a Blackburn season ticket holder, and the club has acted swiftly by confiscating it for the rest of the season. There we are. There were two other Premiership matches scheduled for tonight. QPR versus Chelsea was called off. Newcastle against Everton went ahead. Everton's disciplinary record is the talking point after tonight's game at St James's Park. Nil-nil with under 30 minutes to go. Keith Gillespie and Earl Barrett went for the ball. A corner was the decision. But when Barrett flicked out of the ball, it was judged to be his second bookable offence. And Everton's new £1.7 million signing was sent off on his debut. Within a minute, Everton were down to nine men. Barry Horn challenged Gillespie again, and now it's judged to be his second bookable offence. He was off too. The replay clearly shows that Barry Horn made contact with Gillespie. Not surprisingly, Newcastle made the advantage tell. The under-pressure Everton defence failed to get the ball away, and from close range, Rule Fox fired the ball past Neville Southall. There were 15 minutes to go. A penalty decision minutes later settled the result. David Unsworth bringing down Peter Beardsley. The challenge made right on the edge of the penalty area, inside the decision of the officials. David Ellery, the referee. Peter Beardsley made it 2-0. In all, seven Everton players were booked tonight. The most insensitive display of refereeing I've ever seen was the verdict of Everton boss Joe Royal.
So confirming tonight's results, Blackburn 1, Leeds 1, Newcastle 2, Everton 0, QPR Chelsea was postponed. The draw for Blackburn means their lead at the top is now five points. Newcastle's win has lifted them above Liverpool into third. And Everton remain in trouble, just one place above the bottom four relegation places. The European Super Cup first leg tonight, Arsenal nil, AC Milan nil, and Paul Merson made his return to the Arsenal side as a 74th minute substitute. In Division 1, Swindon and Bristol City was postponed. West Brom nil, Watford 1, Craig Ramage with a 77th minute penalty for Watford. A lot of penalties around tonight. Scottish Cup third round, Clyde Bank 1, Hearts 1, East Fife 1, Ross County nil. Meadowbank and Berwick was postponed, Stirling 1, Airdrie 2. And three leading figures were today charged with bringing the game into disrepute. Wimbledon manager Joe Kinnear and his captain Vinnie Jones have been called before the FA after incidents following last week's premiership defeat at Newcastle. And the Liverpool striker Robbie Fowler faces a similar charge. It's alleged he made improper gestures at spectators at Leicester City on Boxing Day. Well, Sir Stanley Matthews is 80 today. He's a great man and we wish him well. In a few minutes' time, we'll be looking back at his remarkable footballing life. But first, Jürgen Klinsmann. Klinsmann has made an extraordinary impact on the game in this country in a short time. This profile now by John Motson. English football on TV and was fascinated by the atmosphere in the stadiums, by the fast, fast game, how they played here, the fast style of playing football. Things going on in this city, you know, they don't care if there's one football player more or less. <laughs> London is a very big city, it's a cosmopolitan place, very international, and uh, you will uh, see a lot, a lot of different uh, people, different mentalities, and they see so many different people. Uh, so after a while, they don't care anymore who you are and what you are doing. I mean, they recognize you on the street, but then afterwards they say, it's fine, he's, he's there, but leave him alone. <laughs> I'm together with an American girl since uh, more than a year, and she also helps me a lot, you know, improving my English. I mean, I like to live just a normal life, you know, I like to sit in a, in a bar, in a restaurant, reading a newspaper, having a good time. But Klinsmann, as befits a footballer who's played in four countries, has the trappings of an international figure. He's an avid reader of the news, even when he's not making it, as he has regularly since his trumpeted arrival at Tottenham. Never more so than in the last week. Last Wednesday, his face was nearly rearranged by an erratic challenge from the Aston Villa goalkeeper, Mark Bosnich. I was very angry, actually, because uh, I couldn't see any possibility for him to get the ball, because he left uh, the 18-yard box, and uh, uh, he knew exactly that he couldn't use his hands anymore. And he took, I think he took then the risk, I mean, to, to hurt you, I mean, to foul you. And uh, I, was, I think I was just lucky that nothing really bad happened to me. And uh, I, I guess, you know, it was very difficult for the referee to see the, the whole situation uh, because I didn't know where his position was. And maybe he just thought, you know, these two, they crashed together and uh, it was no one's fault. But the foul actually was, was really bad. On the same night, another continental import bared his studs off the pitch. He's in a very difficult uh, situation because the people, they know that he has a very hot temper, that, uh, or he already lost his nerves a couple of times. So the people, the crowds, especially in the away games of Manchester United, they try to provoke him and they try to, to get him until this point when he maybe is uh, he's risking to, to lose his temper again and that's what happened. But I just hope that uh, the, uh, the people at the FA who judge now this case, that they try to get into uh, Cantona's mind, you know, and, uh, and to realize, you know, how much a player in such kind of situations is under tension. And, and, and I mean, then it happens sometimes that you lose control and you do something wrong, and he did something wrong, but he knows that. But, uh, I mean, you should also uh, think of the circumstances why he did it. 
While the Cantona debate raged on, Klinsmann shook off his facial injuries and arrived at Sunderland four days later to further Tottenham's interest in the FA Cup, which didn't exist when he signed. What did exist in the minds of some English football people was the image of a player whose tendency to exaggerate impact when he was tackled was suspiciously close to gamesmanship. In short, Jurgen Klinsmann was accused of diving. When I then came over to Tottenham, uh, the, these whole stories uh, uh, came up in the newspapers and I was wondering and I asked the people, you know, what does that mean? And a few people, they then explained to me that it had to do with the, with the 90 World Cup a little bit. But it really annoys me. I mean, uh, 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 when they boo you, then that means that they actually that they don't understand, you know, how it really works. And uh, they try you then to provoke a little bit. But uh, uh, it's also a sign for me as a player that in, in, in the moment when the crowds, like you take the Cantona case, start to provoke you, start booing you, then uh, it means actually also they fear you. Uh, because they have a lot of respect for you. This Tottenham shirt hangs not in the club shop or in the dressing room, but in a bakery in Burt Nunn, a suburb of Stuttgart. Here, among the pretzels and the brürchen, lies the roots of the work ethic which has kept Klinsmann's feet, figuratively at least, on the ground. This is the family business, where his father, Siegfried, plays an unpretentious part in the local community. He and his wife, Martha, have been carefully protected from media intrusion by their celebrated son. While Jürgen's eldest brother, Horst, has reason to remember what persuaded Jürgen that his future lay not in the bakery, but in football. He worked here before I worked here. Two and a half years, he worked in the bakery before he became a professional soccer player. He tried to track high jump, but one time he fell on the bar and hurt himself that much that he said, no more, I just play soccer and from that time. Since I know him, he played soccer. Jürgen Klinsmann was born in Gingen, 60 kilometers from Stuttgart, and it was here on the village pitch that he started to enjoy playing football. A natural goal scorer was growing up. Ja, also als Kind, da wollte ich immer sofort wieder Anstoß haben und gleich wieder ein Tor schießen. <laughs> Deswegen auch uh, habe ich da mal in einem Spiel 16 Tore gemacht, weil ich sofort den Ball genommen habe, wieder yeah. Yeah. auf den Mittelpunkt gelegt habe und weiterspielen wollte. The young Klinsmann was already attracting attention. Man hat eigentlich schon von klein auf bei ihm gesehen, dass einfach mehr in ihm drin steckt. Er war unwahrscheinlich ehrgeizig und war halt begabt. Er war halt einfach besser damals schon wie die anderen. Er war richtig ehrgeizig, um Tore zu machen. Und man hat gesehen, dass ihm viel, viel mehr drin steckt als, als seine gleichaltigen Kameraden. Werner Gass took Jürgen to nearby Geislingen, where he grew up in a town he still regards as home. But in his early teens, he dreamed of a bigger stage. When you were a youngster developing your football, did you have any heroes or any particular players that you admired? Oh, when I played on the street as a little boy, I changed every day the name. <laughs> <laughs> I had one day I had Obi Seder, the other day was, uh, was uh, Kevin Keegan, or it was uh, uh, Franz Beckenbauer, Günther Netzer. Ich würde sagen, man sollte nie Vergleiche machen, aber auf jeden Fall haben wir Ähnlichkeit in dem Sinne, dass wir bis zum Schluss kämpfen, rackern, ackern. Er läuft sehr viel, er bewegt sich sehr viel. Das habe ich früher auch gemacht. Und wir beide machen Tore. Ich habe sie früher gemacht, er macht sie heute. Und ich wünsche ihm weiterhin, dass er viel Erfolg hat. Er ist der erste German, really, to come here and do what I did in reverse. And it's not easy. I mean, we're different mentalities. We're different race, we've got different ideas on life, and we've lived differently for over 100 years, as people know. But uh, he's come over with a smile on his face, played football the right way, and he's, he's won the respect of everybody in this country. And there'll be a lot of kids now who will become footballers, who in years to come will say one of their favourite players, and they'll, they'll list Jurgen Klinsmann as being very influential on them, because uh, he does it the right way, I think. I would call him a typical German player, yes. All he had all the mentalities, the character what, which, uh, which the German players have. And the biggest compliment I can pay him that he has a good character. He is a character. You can always get something from him. He's, uh, uh, he's a player who is quick. He's not a brilliant player. He's uh, not te technical very good. But um, the most important thing when you, when you contract a uh, player forward, 
that he scores goals and you always get uh, something from him. It was under the tutelage of Franz Beckenbauer that Klinsmann and Germany won the 1990 World Cup in Italy. By now, his was one of the most sought-after signatures in the fiercely competitive European football contractual market. <laughs> So, meine Damen und Herren, damit ist dieses historische Ereignis über die Bühne gegangen. He spent five years with VfB Stuttgart, the Bundesliga base nearest his home. There was two and a half years in Milan with Internazionale, where he won a UEFA Cup medal. Two years followed at Monaco, where he added French to his growing portfolio of languages. And it was to this millionaire's playground that Alan Sugar sailed in on his yacht like some latter-day pirate to snatch Klinsmann's signature at a time when Tottenham looked like falling on their sword. It was the World Cup summer of 94. As Klinsmann put down the white number 18 shirt of Germany and picked up another at White Hart Lane, Tottenham were hardly an appealing prospect. They were six points behind before a ball was kicked and banned from the FA Cup. I just was uh, uh, positive influenced by the way of, of Alan Sugar, how he presented himself and uh, he, he explained immediately the situation of, of Tottenham, uh, the problems of Tottenham to me and uh, and I was fascinated by the idea of coming over to England, playing in the Engle English uh, Premier League, because as a little boy I always watched English football on TV and was fascinated by the atmosphere in the stadiums, by the fast, fast game, how they play it here, the fast style of playing football. And, and so in, I think in two or three days I took a decision and I said, let's go up to London and uh, let's make this experience. There was a two-fold effect uh, of Jürgen. At the time, if you cast your mind back, the club needed a little bit more than just a player. Um, he needed um, some, something special to happen to the club uh, because of the uh, penalties we had imposed on us at the time. So it kind of uh, had, a, had a different effect, you know. It was just uh, a roll-on effect of um, other, you know, everybody getting their act together. And... I never had problems, you know, playing football under a certain pressure. I mean, I went to Italy and uh, the people expected a lot of me. And uh, I went to France in the same way, and uh, I never struggled with it. Uh, on the contrary, maybe I like also this kind of pressure on me. And uh, I came over to England and uh, played well from the beginning on, scored a couple of goals, and, uh, and tried always to give my best. And I think the people, they saw this after, after a couple of weeks, they saw uh, that this is the kind of a player, he always fights, he always gives his best for his team, and, uh, and I think that's the reason why they accepted me. You've played in all these different places. Do you think our system with a premiership and the other divisions, does it seem to you to work? No, I think it, it works quite well. But uh, the fact that they uh, reduce the, the Premier League next season to 20 teams and then the season afterwards to 18 teams, I think it's a good decision. For me, it's a little bit strange to take the, 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 the fact that there are two cup competitions with the Coca-Cola Cup and the FA Cup. And uh, uh, I think, you know, it's it's it's... Like I said already before, it's not such a big problem, uh, big physical problems to play many, many games, but more games you play, and if you play too many games, you lose quality. Quality is something Spurs have often been noted for, and if Klinsmann's presence has shortened their FA Cup price, it's done no harm to their share price. For Alan Sugar, a business decision has helped the Tottenham quotation double on the stock exchange. An early season dip in fortunes saw the demise of Ozzy Ardiles, and the arrival of the more practical Jerry Francis, who steered Spurs into calmer waters in the top half of the Premiership. I was disappointed. I felt sorry for Ozzy Ardiles because I was sure that he w he's a good manager. I'm still sure that he's a good manager. And uh, he was just unlucky in a certain period because uh, we lost certain games in the last minute. And we lost a, a couple of games not because uh, the defence was not organised or not because... Uh, 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 we had real uh, tactical problems. It was because we did too many individual mistakes. That was the reason why we lost too many games, and uh, that was the reason I, why, at the end of the day, Ozzy Ardiles had to leave. Klinsmann signed so many autographs, he hasn't always got time to lift his head from the page. 
Gary. You'll get about six Gary Linnickers for those if you do the really put to Gary on that. You got me. The media attention and demand for interviews is relentless. A German television crew is never far away. And in northwest London, where he lives, Klinsmann keeps his private life private. He prefers to patrol London unrecognized, reveling in the anonymity of the big city. Even his choice of car is unlikely, a 1967 Volkswagen Beetle. The medias, they try to, to put you in a certain box and they always try to pull out this story with, uh, uh, with the Beatle. I mean, it's just that, that I like this car very much and, and now I'm living in London, which is uh, where is, uh, you find a lot of traffic and where you don't need a really fast car, so I brought over only my Beetle. Klinsmann's former Stuttgart colleague, Maurizio Gaudino, is a more recent foreign import. It's great to see how foreign players, you know, can... Uh, 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 how can I say, move up a little bit the standard of the whole game in a certain country, like over the last 10, 15 years, all the foreign players moved to Italy. They brought up the quality, they brought up the whole level, like players like Maradona, Gullit, Van Basten, Reichert, Mateus, you know, and suddenly the whole league you know, was, was on, a, on, a, on a much better level. And I think uh, uh, a similar thing at the moment happens to the uh, English Premier League. Players like Cantona, players like uh, Stefan Schwarz at, at Arsenal, or uh, now coming a player like Yeboa. Uh, these are all players that really can influence the whole, the whole standard of, of the league. When Ozzy Ardiles came here as a player with Tottenham, he made it clear that his big ambition was to play at Wembley in an FA Cup final. I mean, it would be wonderful playing a final at Wembley, for sure. This would be something very special. He's already played in the stadium for Germany, but would relish doing so again either in the 1996 European Championships or for Spurs rather sooner. But the overriding impression is that there's more to Jurgen Klinsmann's life than football. Indeed, it was once reported he was going to retire and become a conservationist. No, that's wrong. I mean, I'm a member of Greenpeace and I support them uh, once in a while with some money, giving them some money, but in a very passive way. And... Uh, uh, Politics is, I mean, I follow the politics like probably anybody else. Uh, and uh, uh, I mean, I read the newspapers, I try to be a little bit informed about the politics situation, political situation in all countries that I probably lived before. Uh, I mean, I had the idea, it was in 91, before we won the UEFA Cup with Inter, maybe uh, to stop playing after the 92 or, ch or European Championship in Sweden because I always actually missed the student life. I always wanted to go to university and to want to study something. And my best friends, they all went to university. And uh, I always, kind of, in a certain way, always was a little bit jealous of them because that's the kind of a life that I missed. But then I realized that I could, have, that I could do actually the same meanwhile I was playing football. So that was also a reason for me going abroad and making different experiences in different countries. So I did my kind of a school then abroad. I learned the languages. Uh, I, I learned to, to handle different mentalities and different people. And uh, now I'm six years abroad and I, I think it was a good school for me too. <laughs> Klinsmann is under contract to Spurs until 1996. But in which European city will he finally put down his roots? I don't know what will come up in my future time because I, I have not decided yet where I want to live. If I will be one day back in Germany or maybe living in Italy where I have a house on the Lake of Como, which is a, a, a very important area uh, for me. So we will see. <laughs> it's a wonderful asset to the game here. Well, now to a footballing genius of yesteryear, Stanley Matthews. So Stan is 80 today, still looking forward rather than back at his own illustrious past. That's his way. Tonight in Stoke, from where he came and to where he's returned, there was a dinner given in his honour. Stanley Matthews embodies everything that's good about the game of football. I think every player likes to play his own sort of game because I don't think anybody could copy Stan or try to copy him. Uh, he just had a style of his own and it was uh, wonderful uh, the ball control that he had. Uh, I mean, was recognised the world over uh, and was appreciated by most of the continental teams that were played again in those days. 
really knew before they played against him that they had a job on their hands. He's a born artist and he's got perfect natural uh, ability and um, I'd say he's uh, well, the greatest swingman of all time. He'll ne never be the likes of him again, for me. They, they used to say to me, I beat two men and, you, and that pass was wonderful. And I said, how do you mean two men? I can't remember it. And when they said that was a great pass, great pass to me, it was a simple pass. I never, I never considered that uh, what I did and what Harry did, I never saw myself. But I knew that when things were going well, I, I pretty fit, how good I played, I don't know. I, but I know when things went bad for you, I couldn't be the defender or, or my passing was bad, I knew that. But how good, I couldn't tell you truthfully how brilliant I was. His name is symbolic of the beauty of the game, his fame timeless and international, his sportsmanship and modesty universally acclaimed, a magical player of the people for the people. So reads the inscription on a statue erected in honour of Sir Stanley Matthews. It stands in Stoke where the Wizard of the Dribble was born. His father, Jack Matthews, was a barber, boxer and a strong influence on young Stanley who practised with anything, tennis balls, tin cans, stones. He attended Wellington Road School in Hanley. He lathered chins in the family barber shop. He leathered footballs and was a perfect pupil. He was quiet, inoffensive, unassuming. There wasn't a bit of devil in him. No tricks in class. But give him a ball out in the yard and you'll get all the tricks you wanted. <laughs> The hours of practice were rewarded. In 1928, an England schoolboys lineup included a 13-year-old from the Potteries. He joined the Stoke City ground staff at 14, played in the reserves at 15. He was in the first team at 17, and in his first full season, he helped the Victoria Ground Club win promotion to the first division. With dazzling wing play, he quickly established himself, and still a teenager, made his full international debut in 1934. Tom Cooper is England's captain. Nillian Park is crowded with 40,000 cheering Welshmen. No tougher international debut could have been chosen for a boy of 19. But Stanley Matthews, just two years a professional, comes through his ordeal with flying colours. Brooke and Tilson, that famous Manchester City pair, score three goals between them. And then Stanley Matthews weighs in with one, a goal in his first international. The England selectors took a little convincing at first. But Stan Matthews wasn't going to be put off from playing to his strengths. If I'm on the edge of the penalty area and there's only one player to beat, I'm going to try to beat him. If I don't beat him and lose it, I haven't lost anything. But if I can beat him on his left side, I can do whatever I want. I think the secret was, was change of pace. As soon as I flicked it, I was very quick. I used to practice uh, 20 sprints a day. Not, 20, not uh, uh, 50 yards, 15 yards, and six shots explode. It's no use being clever on the ball, and you slough off the mark, they'll catch you again. You've got to show them a clean pair of heels. Had the term existed in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, who knows how much...